Hello, welcome and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. It's one of your hosts, Kaitel, and I am joined virtually here in Los Angeles by my co-host Joe, as always from back in our hometown of London. And then as usual, we have a special guest for today's show. In the past, we've had the likes of Ante Kvartic and Milos Dosanovic on to discuss Croatian and Serbian football respectively. But now is the time for us to chat about all things Ukrainian football. And to help us carry that conversation, we're joined by a journalist, fellow podcaster and founder of Zoria Londonsk, the home of Ukrainian football in English. We welcome Ukrainian football expert Andrew Todos to the United Mates football podcast. Andrew, it is an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And how are you doing this evening, mate? No, thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to chatting and yeah, doing fine. Thanks. Um, been a busy summer so far and it's not stopping yet. Uh, it's going to carry on being pretty busy as it progresses too. Nice. Busy is good. Busy is good. Joe, I know you've been um, sort of maybe less busy than usual, actually. It's been a couple of weeks since we last recorded. And of course, in that time, you've had and recovered from covid so how's the old sense of taste doing? I know you lost that, but presumably as a Spurs fan, it's been off for quite a while. Now. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I thought that might be coming. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good now, Kai. I, fortunately, I'm now testing negative. I've, I've done my isolation period. Um, but yeah, I still, my sense of taste is still not really there. But I'm still a Spurs fan. So, you know, things have <laughs> changed. Still very much a Spurs fan. I mean, maybe in some ways I wish I wasn't these days. But um, no, all good, all good. And um, Andrew, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. And um, every time we do a podcast, we always start by asking an icebreaker question to our guests. So we will, of course, do that for you now. So um, we've looked through your Twitter account, Andrew, and we found a very funny tweet from a few years back, which basically it shows... It shows a card you must have made when you were you were a kid, which says Andy's Toy Factory on it. Um, it's very yeah, cute little card from the past. And um, based on that, our um, icebreaker question is going to be effectively, what was your favourite childhood toy? But um, we're going to start, so you've got a bit of time to um, to mull it over. So I'll start with mine. And I don't know if it was my favourite, but the first thing that popped into my head was. Um, this alien toy I used to have when I was younger, which it came in a shell filled with goo. It sounds really weird, but I remember I used to um, enjoy playing with these aliens in goo. Um, very, very random. But Kai, what about you? What was your favourite childhood toy? I think I remember the ones that you're talking about, and they, they were quite a lot of fun. But I think I'll go for something a bit more traditional. Um, Action Man. To, to the American listeners, basically like the, the British equivalent of G.I. Joe. Um, but yeah, Action Man was a solid one. I liked my Beanie Babies. Um, me and my brothers used to just fill up a, a rubbish bin with water over the summer and just get in the bin and then tip it over. That's not really a toy. That was more just like a, using our imagination and stuff. But uh, yeah, I think if I had to pick one, maybe maybe we'll go with uh, with Action Man. Joe, did you, did you own a few Action Men? Yeah, I definitely owned a few action uh, men dolls. Yeah, they were they were great. Um, I remember the I had a Woody one as well, Buzz Lightyear, all, all, all the classics. Um, so yeah, there's there's a few um, suggestions from us. But Andrew, you've had some time to think now. What are you going to go for? Well, I would have said something along the lines of maybe um, Woody or Buzz, but you know, if we're going to keep it like more consistent, I guess throughout the childhood, because I guess they were you know maybe a one or two year depending on what age you actually were. Um, probably Lego, to be honest. I did love a bit of Lego. Um, less the sort of like buildings and the abstract stuff, but more like the little figures that you could get with the <laughs> with the random collections and all that sort of stuff. And I remember filming random rubbish <laughs> back in the day with like the actually my hands in the background. So, yeah, uh, well, let's put it at Lego. That's a solid choice. I definitely own a lot of Lego, have stepped on my fair share of Lego pieces barefoot, which is, I think, as we all know, kind of like the, the greatest pain known to, to mankind. Uh, otherwise, I think Connects was something kind of similar that, that I got into. So that's a good place to start. Speaking of sort of building blocks and whatnot, I guess with Lego, that has provided the foundation for us to build upon the rest of this podcast. And we're going to get into speaking about football because that's what we're here for. So, of course, Andrew, as per your intro, you are a Ukrainian football fanatic and obviously you know these are your people and Ukraine has produced some great players down the years but where did it all start specifically for you what's your earliest footballing memory and 
when and why did you decide to go all in on Ukrainian football in particular as someone who lives in England, actually? So we'll quickly start as in why I like Ukrainian football to begin with anyway. It's because I've got Ukrainian ancestry and family. So the connection's there, but I've been born and raised in London and lived here my whole life. Earliest football memory, though, will have to be my first ever live football match, which was at Wembley Stadium, year 2000, Ukraine versus England. So uh, a local derby for me. Um, also, I lived, I was born in Wembley and lived for the first eight years of my life in Wembley, literally a road behind the old Wembley Stadium. So it's all a bit of football, you know, connectivity with my life and that sort of stuff. But in general, was at that game, but as a four-year-old, not not the most memories. I just remember like the old tier of like the crumbling Wembley away end that we were in. And that's pretty much it. But if we're going to talk about proper footballing, footballing stuff, probably the 2006 World Cup, um, slightly older then, uh, 10-year-old Ukraine were playing, got battered by Spain, then battered Saudi Arabia and then went on to their greatest ever run at a World Cup where they reached the quarterfinals, losing to the eventual winners, Italy. And yeah, and then following a few years of me just following Ukrainian football casually, I've always had an interest in Ukrainian football, but just European football in general, because I like geography and that sort of stuff. And I like all those weirdo um off-piece teams that you can find that are currently are coming up in, you know, the conference league and that sort of thing. And yeah, always interested in Ukrainian football. Ukraine hosted the Euros in 2012, went over for that. Um, just was still quite a bit too young to sort of be exploring that on my own. Then from around 2015, started going to away games and stuff with my friends, um, similar ones like me that were born here but of Ukrainian family and stuff like that and we were going to like an away game once every year it was sort of like a special occasion um I went to Ukraine and then we started branching out to like Iceland Portugal for like World Cup qualifiers and stuff like that and it accumulated with once I finished university I was just milling around just before I got my first job um the following autumn so I had a bit of a summer break and just decided to start a sort of a football blog thing for Ukrainian football in English because there's a lot of info and coverage of Ukrainian football out there, but it's all in Russian and Ukrainian and it's not very accessible to most of the world. And I was always getting frustrated when people were misrepresenting Ukraine on the whenever they play in Europe or club football and that sort of stuff. So I just sort of made it my mission to, in my spare time, over the past three years, so I started in 2018, um, just to be completely indulged in Ukrainian football. And ever since then, I've got even more involved in it in terms of seeing a lot of away games. 2019, I saw like nine matches out of a possible 10 that Ukraine national team played in a year. Been lucky enough through my journalist accreditation to visit matches throughout COVID as well, albeit rather expensive COVID tests and all that sort of stuff, which the wages were going on, but money well spent, depending on uh, what way you look at it. And yeah, and uh, just come back from the Euros where I represented the Ukrainian Sports Press Association and saw all the Ukraine matches and was lucky enough to actually be at the final at Wembley too. Oh, nice. It sounds like quite the journey you've had since you almost started in similar uh, footsteps to uh, Raheem Sterling in sort exactly. of, yeah. of uh, Wembley Stadium. But obviously, you've, you know, you've gone down this U Ukrainian route instead, which I think Joe will ask you a bit more about. I will indeed. Yeah. And it's um, it's interesting, Andrew. Obviously, you know, you run the blog and you, you've gone to a, a number of Ukraine matches over the last few years. So, Ukrainian football culture is something that's important to you, but you, you get it and you understand it as well, clearly. So from your perspective, is there anything about following the Ukraine, the Ukrainian national team or even just the domestic league that makes the whole experience so special? And is there anything you've learned that's quite sort of unique to being a Ukrainian football fan? 
Well, the national team and like the domestic side are two separate followings. I'd put that into like two different brackets from a start. So let's go domestic route first. Since the war with Russia and the annexation of Crimea in 2014, Ukrainian football domestically has had a massive decline because a lot of the teams in the East have had to relocate. Um, teams in Crimea have had to fold, not been allowed to play. And in general, which isn't even a result of just the war, but just general bad mismanagement of clubs, because a lot of football isn't run like a business. Well, football clubs aren't run like businesses in Ukraine for the most part. It's just like some rich businessman has a bit of a play toy, which they all staunchly deny. But, you know, when they get fed up of it, sometimes as the club gets in too much debt, they just let it go, which for any listeners who know, maybe FC Dnipro, who got to the Europa League, court, uh, Europa League final in 2015, you know, they had a massive history, massive club. And then literally about two years later after that, due to some debts, their oligarch owner just stopped funding and the club fell down the pyramid and now plays in the amateurs but like the original club is like bust per se so it's that sort of stuff however over the past few years since i've started getting into ukrainian football a lot more deeply luckily a a lot of other clubs are coming back through the help of oligarchs trying to get back into it other methods where there's like sort of newfound wealth in not newfound wealth but there's a lot of agricultural companies like in villages and that sort of thing that have started to have their own teams and they've been started from the amateurs going up to like the third division second division and then into the premier league and even some of them are playing in european competition now the sustainability of them is so far undecided as in we don't know how they're gonna continue and that sort of thing and maybe depending on who the owner is that will depend on how far and uh, in sort of what trajectory they'll carry on in. But in general, I think Ukrainian football is on a slow, but um, but slightly steady return to its sort of heyday of 2012, 2013, 14, when, you know, the likes of Shakhtar, Dynamo, Metalist, Dnipro, where they were all like big performing teams in Europe. And, you know, the average fan, had heard of them and now as we're saying we've got these agricultural smaller sides who are sort of taking their place but then there's a lot of a complicated story with metalists who are coming back and we can go into that a bit later but that's that's the whole sort of massive story in itself but yeah i think ukrainian football is it's it's unique because there aren't that many fans um like for the for the big games that go to the games. There's a good ultra culture for them. For the majority of clubs, they do a good atmosphere, good pyro, but there's only so much that an ultra group can do at a game, if you know what I mean, when the, the rest of the stadium's empty. Um, but, they're, but they're pretty cool. A lot of them have fought in the war. Um, some suspect characters, of course, but on the whole, they you know make Ukrainian football a bit more atmospheric, especially when you're in the stadiums or watching on TV. There's some cool players coming through. Um, There's less of the sort of pulling power that there was in the past, but it's meant that some more Ukrainian youngsters are allowed to develop more sort of uncut gems and that sort of thing. And, you know, if I had to put one thing that's unique about Ukrainian football, I'd say that actually it's the lower leagues that are slightly more exciting especially in recent years um there's just been a sort of an upheaval of these smaller clubs and because they're slightly smaller they've got smaller fan bases but they've come out and support their teams a bit more and it seems like it's bringing sort of a new found representation for their smaller town or city and it's just making Ukraine as one of the largest countries in Europe having a bit more of a a decentralized footballing system where it's not just based all around like the east or in Kyiv but like other areas too and then if we go to the 
international side of things that's a slightly different story so up and down 2016 is probably one of the lowest um, points of Ukrainian football they qualified for the Euros but they finished the tournament with zero goals zero points so very embarrassing um, and Shev Andrei Shevchenko obviously the Ukrainian icon and legend took the role in his first managerial job lots of skepticism when he was given it because like hey this guy's not got any experience how can we just give him this sort of one of the biggest roles probably of his they were having his career in terms of privilege and and um sort of esteem that he can he do it first two years were pretty shaky that's for sure ukraine didn't qualify for the 2018 world cup in russia but you know a lot of people are like well who cares about that because there was questions of whether ukraine would go to that or not and it sort of in the end uh erased those questions of even needing to think about that and then since 2018 up until this euros um the delay ukraine have probably been on one of their most positive trajectories that they've ever had um the whole country has been supporting the team getting really involved in even qualifying rounds and games and then just this summer's tournament a lot of people came out into like squares to watch ukraine on big screens and that sort of thing and i think it's the UPL has re recently started and just these opening match days, there's been a sort of a re-found interest in Ukrainian domestic football. And I think that's a positive that's been instilled following the legacy of this Euros and just maybe the reigniting of a bit of faith in football in general that the national team gave them during that um, quite historic Euro campaign, despite the quite a bit of an unsavoury exit 4-0 against England. But Hey ho on the whole um a successful campaign yeah i mean uh, we'll talk about it in a bit a very successful campaign and it just shows as well what you know the, the power of something like that and how it can reignite um, interest in um, the domestic game which it, it certainly sounds like it's done which is it's a good thing i think for ukrainian football but um we're going to play a game now it's a game that we often play on the united mates football podcast and it's called away which lads so um Kai and Andrew, effectively, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to name the starting lineups from two English sides that have faced off against Ukrainian teams in um, Lovely, yeah. European football recently. <laughs> uh, yeah, gonna, so we, we, I mean, if you want, Andrew, you can have a go at the Ukrainian teams, but it, I don't know, it might, could be tricky, but we'll, we'll start the English. Let's do the English, uh, English go, go for it. Teams. So, um, the first, um, and you, you can work together on this as well. So the, um, the first game I'm going to was a game in December 2017. Um, Shakhtar Donetsk played Man City and they actually beat Man City 2-1. I think um, Paolo Fonseca, who nearly became the Spurs manager, um, was managing Shakhtar back then. But what, um, what I'm going to ask you guys to do is name the Man City team from that evening. So, um, go, yeah, take it away. And obviously, if you get stuck, I'm here to help or provide clues. I always like to start with keepers. Go ahead, yeah, go for it. Well, I was going to say, was uh, Claudio Bravo in goal? No, no, he was not. Ooh. Now I'm stumped off the bat. Because I, re I remember this game. I think it was like a dead rubber, and that's why Shakhtar won it. Because I think it was like the final game. Of the yeah, Britain. so yeah. City had already qualified, and that makes it even more trick, because I would have thought Bravo would have been in goal for that one. But was Joe Hart still around? No, no, no. It was... Um... Oh, my God. As in, as in, I, I can see where your guys are going, but you, yeah, you maybe you've gone down a sort of a slightly false path here in your thinking. Well, maybe we can circle back to the, yeah. to the keeper and names. It was Otamendi. I'm just going to throw out just just a no. lot of city names. <laughs> no, Ot Otamendi wasn't. They had um they had a back three by the looks of it, and it is quite unusual. I'd say you should know all the players, but it's um it's not your typical man. <laughs> Oh, was Fernandinho the man who's played for both of those sides playing? Yeah, he was actually in the back three. Um, he's the most recognisable. The, the other two, um, you are probably going to need clues, so I'd probably recommend moving on to the midfield. But Oh, wait, oh, wait. let's just go for a random one. Was Fabian Delph there? Delph wasn't starting. No, I don't know if he was brilliant. On the he... Great. That was, there goes the, the wild card. <laughs> All right, let's see. 
um, was did they happen to have one of those other Fernando guys? Like, didn't they have a guy called Fernando? They, they did. He wasn't playing in this game. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Carl Walker. He was on the bench. No. On the bench. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there was another fullback who signed at a similar time to Carl Walker who, who was playing in this game. Ooh. Struggling. Um, Kolarov? No, he wasn't, he wasn't playing either. And actually... <laughs> The guy who's playing what looks like maybe wing back is a bit of a bit of a, a twist, but we'll get. We'll... <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, um, was David Silva playing? No, he wasn't. <laughs> but honestly, I feel like you, you're getting on. There, there are names that you will get. It's not quite. There's there are rogue names. There's there's quite a lot of recognisable right. people in this team. I'm going to throw a uh, Kalechi and Acho. No, I think he left by this point. I think he's cool. he's gone. He's gone to Leicester by this point. Deary me. Um... Okay, we'll take it back to the goalie. And the goalie, it's their first choice goalie. Well, Edison, Edison was yeah. already there. Edison, okay. that was the first season. So there you go. So you've got Edison and you've got Fernandinho. Um, Sorted. So the, so the two other centre-backs, one of them was on loan at another Premier League team last year. So that, that's one of them. Tosin Adarabeo. There you go. So he played. Bloody one of hell. Yeah. For Man City. And then the other centre back who makes up the back three was a big money signing who didn't, it didn't really go to plan. Oh, Mangala. There we go. Yes. So there we go. So that's the defence. <laughs> um, we now, the, so the two centre mids, all I'll say is that you, you, you'll know them both. That's all, that's all I'm going to tell you because okay. they're quite like, Oof. Um was G- Gundogan there yet? Yeah, he's one of them. Okay. So he's Gundogan, one of them. D- De Bruyne. No, he wasn't playing. <laughs> was Milner still there? No, I think he must be at Liverpool at this point. Oh god. Um Bernardo Silva? He was playing. It looks like he was one of two behind the striker, but yeah, he, he was playing. So you've still got four people to get. Okay. Let us see. I mean, we're missing the striker who, if it's not, I mean, Gabriel, is it Gabriel Jesus? It is. It is. Okay. So you've got, you've got an attacking mid, a wing back, and then someone who else that's at wing back, but it, it, that's just a don't think of him as a wing back because it's weird. He's Neither not... of them are Mendy? No. But oh, oh, no. No, I thought. I thought that Zinchenko would be playing, but I don't think he was there at this point, no, was he? No, he, he wasn't. He wasn't even on the bench. Uh, yeah. Oh, was Sterling in the team? No, he, he wasn't. Bloody hell. Um, so the attack, the other attacking midfielder who was playing with Bernardo Silva is no longer at Man City, is a, is a clear. But he was, he, you know, he's a good player. Mm. Nasri was gone by then. Um, yeah, no, no. You think think more recent. I think you're bloody hell. Mind blank. Yeah, likewise. Um, what right. nations are we sort of like dealing? So with? we got okay. The the nation for the attacking mid, I think, will give it away. But I'll <laughs> German. Oh, it's Leroy Sane. There you go. Leroy oh. Sane. So now we're down to the fullbacks. One of my clues. For one of the fullbacks, he's not a wing back. He's he's a very famous player now, but it's odd he was playing in December 2017. So that's sort of a clue there, if that makes any sense. And then the other guy is is a wing back who I don't think is at Man City anymore, but they signed him around the time they signed Walker as well. Oh. Well, I was gonna say Oh, Angelino. I've got the fullback, I think. Sorry, I, I think was I'm with it. Yeah, Danilo. Yeah. So there you go. So now, now we're so now we're down to the final player. Who my clue is? It's strange he was playing for Man City in December 2017. Is it Phil Foden? Yeah, he started that game. What the hell? I know. Yeah. How weird is that? And according to BBC Sport, he was kind of like left wing back. Um, but there, there we go. That was Man City's team. What an atrocious attempt! But um, <laughs> that was good fun. We got there in the end. <laughs> anyway, you're, you're warmed up now. I've got one more, um, one more game for you. And it, okay. It doesn't involve Shakhtar or Dynamo Kiev. It involves Zaria Luhansk. 
when they played Manchester United in uh-huh. December 2016. Man, you won this game 2 0. Let's have a look. Before I get you to. Yeah, I think you, you, sh- you should do okay with this. It's just bear, it's December 2016. It's going back a few years. But yeah, here we go, guys. Take it away. I'll let Andrew have the first say. Oh, um. I'm trying to think. I think that was Mourinho back then. Um, I think it was the year they actually won the Europa League. Okay. Mkhitaryan? Yeah, he actually scored in the game. So that, that's one of cool. them. Cool. Good start. Um, Eric Bailly? Yep. Yeah, there you go. Two out of two. Uh, and then I'm just going to throw like three defenders' names out right now real quick. Uh, Phil Jones, Chris Smalling, and Marcus Rojo. You got one of them right. Marcus Rojo was oh. a, was the by centre back partner. So okay. there you go. So you've got three people so far. A Romero in goal. Yeah, there you go. So this time it worked. The, the sub goal. Ibra <laughs> <laughs> um, was playing, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, and I think he might have actually got the other goal. Yeah, he did. So yeah, he was up front. Cool. Uh, Rashford. No, Rashford was not. Didn't start. He was on the bench. Unused sub. Martial. No, he didn't play either. Brilliant. Uh... Okay. What I'll say is there's no, there's no like there's no one too random in this team. Every kind of all makes sense from that time period. Ashley Young. Yeah, he was the right back. So you just got the the left back of the defence to go there. Well, it wouldn't have been Luke Shaw. Um... <laughs> Certainly not. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Who was it? He's no longer at the club. He's like a recognised like left back. Oh, is it Daily Blind? Yeah, you go. Yeah. Ooh. So you got the defence. Um, you've just got both the centre mids and sort of two others. Okay. Two sort of attacking mids as well. Centre mids. Uh, Pogba. Yep, he was playing. Oh yeah, it was quite a strong lineup for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Matic? Nope. I don't know if he was at United at this point. Mm. Laney? No. Ooh. I think he might have been on the bench, but he wasn't starting. Ooh. The other centre midfielder is no longer at Man U, but was like a, a first team player during his time there. Interesting. Um, mm. Okay. I was just thinking of Michael Carrick, but he must have been retired by then. I think he might have been the coaching staff at this point. <laughs> uh, um, bloody hell. Yeah, now, I'm, now I'm slowing okay. down. So forget that centre mid. So there's, there's, there's two sort of... Att- they're, well, they're, they're part of a three behind the Ibrahimovic. Oh, Mata, one Mata. Yeah, he was playing. So you just got another one of the kind of attacking mids. Is it... And I'll do the... Is it Jesse Lingard? No, no, no. Oh. no. One of them is a player that I guess you wouldn't really think of him as an attacking mid traditionally, but I guess at, at this point in his United career, that's where he was playing. And then the other one is the centre mid. Mm-hmm. But they're both no longer at the club. Okay. And you, and yeah, one of them is now a football manager. What the manager. heck? Is, he isn't currently a football manager, the attacking the one who was right. Um, are either of them English? Yep, yeah. very much English. One of them. Hmm. What right, was Wayne Rooney in that team? Yeah, Wayne Rooney. Oh my it God. Must have been his, it must have been his final year at United. Oh, Jesus, so. <laughs> this is the okay. slowest team of all time. Yeah. By the way, just yeah. looking at yeah. the paper. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> so we've got we've got one more player left, and he's the he was the guy playing alongside Pogba. Uh, a first team centre mid during his time at United, a good player, still playing at a very high level. So, yeah, gosh, who is this? Um, not English, right? Right, hmm, yeah, really struggling with this one. Um, I'm trying to eat. Oh, and the Herrera, there we go. Ah. So, Okay. There we go. Yeah, I, there was a lot of improvements on that team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was yeah. a lot. It was a strong team Mourinho put out. No wonder they won the Europa League. Exactly. Bloody hell. 
Uh, they weren't messing around Man United. But yeah, there we go. That was Hawaii Witch Lads, which is always um, it's always good fun. But now we're um, I know you were talking a bit earlier, Andrew, about the national team, but we're just gonna we're just gonna talk a bit about that again, actually. So we're just gonna talk about Euro 2020. Obviously, like you said, it was a great campaign for the Ukrainian national team. Obviously, ended in defeat to England. Kai and I probably enjoyed that match a bit more. <laughs> but um, yeah, just I guess talking about it, um, Ukraine did so well. Was it expected? And sort of another question: where, where do you where does the national team go from here as well? Is it is it sort of a, a good era ahead of ourselves for the Ukrainian team? So that's actually a 50 50 because, well, all this work that I was just talking about earlier, so from 2018 onwards, so the debut Nations League, which England did quite well in, Ukraine did quite well in that. They were in Division B, they like won the majority of their games, got promoted to League A, and they were playing in League A last year um, during COVID got relegated due to the fact that they couldn't fulfil one of their last fixtures against Switzerland and then Cass ruled a 3-0 forfeit. All a bit farcical and on non-sporting terms, Ukraine got relegated from League A. So that was a bit of a downer. And then this, the start of this year, um, Ukraine lost, well, not lost, but they lost a few points in their opening World Cup qualifier. So they drew with France, which was a great result, in Paris. And they followed it up with a draw against Finland and a draw against Kazakhstan. And everyone was like, oh, my God. Ahead of the Euros, this isn't going to be great. And then the actual Euros campaign turned out to be OK. Ukraine played fairly valiantly against Netherlands, one of those entertaining group stage matches that I think a lot of people will remember. Didn't get the win there, unfortunately played a lot better against North Macedonia in the first half and then slipped away in the second. And a lot of questions are being asked, like, what's going on here? This isn't sort of the best we've seen from Ukraine. Well, compared to the actual qualifying campaign in 2019, when Ukraine were may, maybe even under rose tennis spectacles, but they were like really good. They won their group. They had Portugal in it. They had Serbia in it. They blew Serbia away 5-0 in one of those matches beat Portugal at home, drew them away. So maybe there was some sort of stagnation following the COVID break where Ukraine did, couldn't go straight in that momentum from that qualifying campaign straight into the summer of last year, 2020, into the tournament. But, you know, when you're actually looking at it from a hindsight perspective and the fact that Ukraine actually got to the quarters anyway, which the average fan probably was expecting them to get to the quarters at least or put in a valiant showing in the round of 16. And the general aim before Ukraine started the tournament, Shevchenko was saying that getting out of the group is the main priority because Ukraine had never done it before in their history. They've only been to two previous ones and then this one, so the third. They did that through a luck and the skin of their teeth because... Austria beat them in the final group game and then through a massive uh, positive uh, um, spate of events where I think Sweden beat Poland. There was some draw somewhere else. Denmark beating Russia and all these other things, like all of it went in hand and actually worked out better because Ukraine played Sweden in the round of 16 and if they had finished second for example in that group they would have ended up playing Italy and you know Italy was pretty decent um, as we saw so yeah and that Sweden game will live long in the memory of Ukraine fans Um, the 121st minute winner was just like you know pure euphoria and just ecstatic craziness just on the fact that Ukraine nick that on the skin of their teeth as well but you know no one really cares because it was just such a super sub last second moment that yeah uh Artem Dovbik the scorer of that played 16 minutes the whole campaign and he's in like Ukrainian folklore now so that's so yeah I I spoke to Sky Sports News like the day after um 
and they asked sort of what's the legacy of this team, as in the one that played the Euros, rather than what's going forward. But I said that it's probably going to go down as one of Ukraine's greatest ever sides. And there was a lot of hate because I was like, oh, you, they got battered 4-0 in the quarters or whatever. But if you look at it in context, it's only the second side that's ever reached the quarterfinals in Ukrainian history. Maybe it, it, it's not at the level of the side that reached those quarterfinals in 2006 at that World Cup. But nonetheless, it, it can certainly be ranked up there based solely on their achievement in where they got there. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's tournament football. You know, you always get these like random results. England weren't playing too great throughout the campaign, you know, 1-0, 1-0 in the group stages. And then, you know, they made the final after some great displays later on. So, you know, you can say, oh, maybe this, maybe the collective squad isn't as good as it was in the past or something like that. But it certainly will rank up there for the time being and probably for the foreseeable future. And then going forward after this uh, Euros, Andriy Shevchenko, he's already made it clear that he wants to venture out into club football. The question is where it's going to take him at the moment because you know he only he has done well with Ukraine but being an international manager doesn't necessarily follow through into club football because you know you've got to work every day you've got to work with different players and you go you know you've got to be dealing with all the signings and all the other complicated stuff that you probably don't have to deal with in you know international football so and I'm sure that he wants to sort of start off relatively comfortably, not comfortably, but relatively high off anyways, you know, with the likes of Chelsea or an AC Milan. And he's not, I don't see any near at the moment him getting to walk into either of those jobs, obviously because of Tuchel and, you know, Milan as well doing all right. So I think he's probably, there's a general consensus that he'll stay until the end of World Cup qualifying, which obviously ends this autumn and then what we don't know as i mentioned about those three draws at the start of the year in the qualifying campaign doesn't set ukraine off to the best start but you know they've got every chance of still at least finishing second and then there's the playoffs which ukraine have got a very awfully bad record in but you know it's anyone's game especially in the state of this team at the moment which i think is something i spoke about prior to the tournament as well, it's not got the sort of stars or icons as a Shevchenko because that's going to take some beating anyway because he's a, you know, one-of-a-kind Ballon d'Or winner, etc. But it's very much some of all its parts. Got a lot of good players, got some new youngsters coming through, which are quite exciting, who got some good experience at that Euros and hopefully it sets them up for the coming years and some more consistent qualifying for international tournaments. Just on that, you know, last minute winner alone in the round of 16. That's like the type of moment that you'd hope could inspire a new generation of, you know, Ukrainian football fans. And you mentioned the, the, the goal scorer going down in folklore already. So it's quite a momentous occasion. Otherwise, you certainly come leaps and bounds from that draw against Kazakhstan that I guess you were referencing earlier. Although I think if Borat taught us anything, it was what? They're the number one exporters of potassium. <laughs> so you don't have to feel too ashamed. You know, they've quite a, quite a notorious nation themselves. On... Um, Shevchenko obviously being the guy, the legend, and then you were referencing sort of like a new group, a new crop of, of players coming through. I wanted to run a few of those names past you, um, individuals from this Euro team, like someone who we actually didn't really see a whole lot of. I think, uh, is it Sihankov, if I'm saying that correctly, from Kiev? And then um, another one who actually did excite was Shaparenko. I know at left back, there's a guy called Mikolenko. And these guys, of course, are all based still in Ukrainian domestic football. Otherwise, there's someone who I don't think even made the squad, and that's Andrei Lunin, who's the young goalkeeper at Madrid. And then someone who was there, of course, is Inchenko at City. So he's someone who we're already pretty familiar with. But if I'm correct, I think these are sort of some of the younger guys who could be carrying the team forward. On the likes of Sihankov, Shaparenko, and Mikolenko, do you think we'll be seeing them on a bigger scene within European football in, in just a matter of time? And is Lunin really a special goalkeeper that we might be sort of excited to see in years to come so we'll start with the Dynamo Kiev lot so those three that you mentioned there at the start and we'll play for Dynamo Kiev and the issue with the fact of them moving elsewhere is I think less to do with themselves and it's more to do with the way 
Dynamo Kiev runs itself and the owner doesn't like letting his players go for low sums of money. And we've seen with it as a prime example as Andriy Yarabolanko, who was a very exciting player, you know, throughout the early 2010s. Everyone was like, oh, this guy's the new Ukrainian wonder kid. And then he didn't end up leaving Ukraine until he was 27, 28. And he moved to Dortmund, suffered a serious injury, went to West Ham, suffered two serious injuries. And he's and those injuries have had a real impact on his career. And it, it never really took off as many people expected, although he is certainly a Dynamo Kiev legend because he scored loads of goals there, played relatively well in Europe as well. But he's never really been able to hit the heights that he has for like Ukraine cult status domestically and for the national team that he has for his other European clubs. And that's something that some of these players, like, for example, Tsankov, people are scared of repeating itself because tsankov has been linked relatively, maybe loosely, over the past couple of seasons with, I think, Everton. I think Leicester were linked with him one time. Even Spurs, I heard some random rumour, but no one knows how deep any of this was. And he's probably been Yeramolenko's replacement since Yeramolenko left all those years ago in like 2018 or whenever it was. So the general consensus is that these players should be moving on to get, and they have definitely got the ability to at least start off in a Syria or maybe not go straight to a, you know, a top three side in any of these leagues, but certainly play it up to you know a mid-table rank side or something like that in the top five leagues and show or at least put an effort in and see what you can do because if we draw parallels to Zinchenko as you mentioned Zinchenko left Ukraine very early he went to Russia early on and then he was still only 18 when he joined City and you know under the tutelage of Guardiola he's turned into like a probably one of Ukraine's best players like he's he's a class player on the basis of, you know, the coaching, etc., that he has received under Guardiola and sort of the relentlessness of not going to Wolves or where else when they've tried to offload him and sort of the mentality that he has. And that's what you fear about these other players because they're quite comfortable. I think they get paid OK wages and not necessarily a need to leave. Um so we'll see. McCollumcore is probably the one that a lot of people have their hopes on being the most realistic in leaving because he's been linked with a lot of Serie A clubs like Roma, uh, AC Milan in recent years, even Inter have been quite um, excited by him. So we'll see. Shaparenko, the one that probably stood out the most out of all these young players at that campaign, he's probably the most low-key in terms of I've not really heard anyone else wanting him or anything like that. And he's a bit of a quiet player. I'm just not sure when that's going to come around. And just sadly, off the basis of all these historic other moves, even Yefen Konoplyanka, the, the iconic player that he was, playing for Dnipro, he played there for a long time and then left after that 2015 final. That was probably slightly too late for him as well because he was at Sevilla for one season. Emery didn't like him. And he went to Schalke and then Schalke were having their issues and he was getting blamed for a lot of performances, even though he's like scoring loads of goals and things like that. And now he's back at Shakhtar in, well, he's in back in Ukraine at Shakhtar. He's like a bench player, doesn't even play. So that was like a massive fall from grace. Uh, so my, <laughs> my recommendation to any of those players would be to leave as soon as possible, just to, you know, make your career last a bit longer and maybe you know see what you can see what you can do because you know as we all know football is only have a small um window to achieve things and you know the longer they put it off uh, sadly it might um, be detrimental whether we'll see any of these players leave i don't know yet i've not really seen any serious interest for any of these players uh, or heard any sort of links like that this summer yet. But, you know, we've still got a month to go before the window closes. Fingers crossed at least maybe one of them goes. And Andriy Lunin, the reason he didn't make the Ukraine national team final squad was because, plain and simple, he just didn't play at Real Madrid. 
uh, last season. Um, he's been on loan at some Liga Segunda teams in the past. He was at Real Madrid for the whole season last year, played one game in like the Copa del Rey, conceded a goal and they lost to like a third tier or a second tier side. And it was like, well, that was his one chance to sort of have a bit of a cup run, have some appearances. Didn't come off. But Carlo Ancelotti now, new manager, says that he's going to be counting on him a bit more. He played a good friendly against Rangers the other day, even though Real Madrid actually lost that. But he, a lot of a lot of positivity to be seen and hopefully he can make his way back into the Ukraine team, especially with um, Piatov looking like he's on his way out uh, finally after many long, long years. <laughs> yeah, Piatov does seem to have been around, well, forever. <laughs> what, a, what a character that guy is. But um, look, e- either way, I guess the positive thing is there's some exciting young Ukrainian players, whether or not we see them in other leagues remains to be seen. But our final question is about Ukrainian players that have played um, in other leagues. And unfortunately for some of these guys, they were good players, but things didn't quite go to plan. So we're mm-hmm. talking about the likes of Voronin at Liverpool, of Chigrinsky at Barcelona. I mean, even, I guess you could add someone in this list who I don't, I reluctantly add him because he was actually quite good for Spurs. And I think you actually interviewed him recently. Adam, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rebrov, obviously <laughs> the key legend, um, things didn't quite go to plan for him at Spurs, albeit he did maybe, well, he did a lot better than Voronin did. Um, when, when we talk about players like this, Andrew, who were clearly talented players, especially when they were playing in um, the Ukrainian league, what, why do you think it, it didn't work out for them? What, what, what's your thoughts on, yeah, for instance, a Voronin at Liverpool or a Chigrinsky at Barcelona? Why, why didn't it work? Well, personally, I don't, it's not a vendetta or anything like that. I just never really rated Voronin. He, he was okay in the Bundesliga, but for whatever reason, I call him the Ukrainian Emil Heskey in terms <laughs> of he's got a very similar national team goal-scoring record. So they've both got the odd 70 caps. And they scored like eight goals. Do you know what I mean? And, and you know, as as as, as centre forwards who started a lot of those games, you know, that's pretty shambolic, in my opinion. So yeah, the reason I think he he blamed a lot of stuff when he was in Liverpool, like the weather, like he said that everyone was like ugly in Liverpool. You know, all these really quite offensive things. And he's just not, he's just a bit of a, a bit of a poor bloke, really. So that that you know, bit of an anomaly. Turinsky, I'm not sure what happened to him at Barcelona because he was really there's a lot of prospects coming out for him, um, a lot of high hopes, and I think maybe just that price tag of it was like 25 million is quite big at the time when he moved, and must have just weighed down on him, and it just didn't work out. But a lot of these Ukrainian players, some for some of them, it's like learning the language, just adopting to different cultures, maybe just playing in a different system. Because Sadhir Lebrov, as, as you mentioned in our, in our um, interview with him for our podcast, he mentioned the difficulties at Spurs were more to do with playing a different system. So he was like, at Dinamo Kiev, he was playing, I think, in a, in a two or something like that up top. And then when he arrived at Spurs, he was asked to play in a completely different role. And it was difficult for him to adapt in that and obviously as you know in the Premier League it's make or break there's not really much of a settling in period even back in the early 2000s so I think he scored an all right amount of goals in his first campaign like 12 or something like that and but it just you know with like managerial differences and all that sort of problems which I don't think Spurs were at their best back then either so that didn't help so yeah, it, it's for whatever reason, it just seems like a bad luck just follows Ukrainian players, especially when it comes to the UK. Apart from Zinchenko, who has probably broken that mould, but he arrived as a bit of an anomaly in the fact that he arrived relatively early in his career when he wasn't established, when he was allowed to give a bit of time. There wasn't any like massive price tag on his neck. It took him a fair few years to get in the team and even then he's playing left back, which isn't even his real position. So credit to Zinchenko on that perspective, but then, you know, you can compare it to other players. So like Oluzhny, who was a 
at Arsenal uh, towards the end of the 90s and early 2000s. Same with him. He was like one of Ukraine's greatest all-time fullbacks, but he came just past his 30s. You know, the legs were going a bit. I think he played centre-back a few times and stuff like that. Won a few FA Cups. But in general, he wasn't seen as some sort of, wow, this guy's amazing, because I think he even lost like a battle with Lee Dixon um, in in the sort of team. But yeah, Shevchenko as well, he was dealing with a lot of injuries at the time when he joined Chelsea. That was when he sort of, his career sort of fell off slightly. And the worst thing is, is that a lot of people judge these Ukrainian players on their time in the Premier League because that's like the only time they sort of saw them up close. And like people are like, how the hell did Shevchenko win a Ballon d'Or and all this sort of stuff when, you know, if you followed Serie A back in the day, he was like unplayable at, at times. So, I don't know. Hopefully that trend breaks soon. Um, other than Zinchenko, maybe some other players will come at some point. We've already got more players in recent years testing themselves in the bigger leagues. Um, Malinovsky, for one, didn't have a great Euros. That was down to injury as well and being played out of position. But he's been tearing up Syria with Atalanta. Um some other players coming through. So Yaramchuk, who had a good Euros, he's still at Ghent, but there's every prospect that he's going to move to a top five league this summer. And hopefully, you know, at 25, it's just before his prime, he can put a foothold in one of those bigger sides. And I think he's got sort of some of those physical tendencies and bit of pace that will help him out in those leagues that, you know, some other players that come in, with you know maybe not acclimatized to the sort of fast pace and just the the way of way of playing has had in in the past for some other Ukrainian players yeah well I mean as we said there's been a few players in the past it didn't work out for them but it's certainly looking like going forward I guess we'll wait and see that there's already the Zinchenko's the Malinovsky's it feels like you know there's a lot to be excited about um, for these players. But I'll just end on something with a story about Rebroff. First ever North London derby I went to, I think I was six years old. Spurs drew one all with Arsenal and Rebroff scored a diving header. Great goal. I remember it was a night game. <laughs> uh, so there's a good Sir Guy and Rebroff memory for everyone. Lovely. <laughs> no doubt Spurs made a DVD about that. <laughs> yeah, we well, probably should have done. But um, right, it was probably a VHS back then. Yeah, I guess Sorry. it was 20 years ago. Crazy times. But, um, that is um, all we've got time for today. Um, as always, big thank you to Kaitel, my co-host, and also a very, very special thank you to um, Andrew uh, for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed yourself, but also um, how can our listeners best um, follow you and everything that you're up to at the moment? Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. A uh, bit different from some of the other podcasts I've had, first games I've played on here, so very enjoyable. Um despite the poor performance in that first round, but um, we made up for it, Kai. Eh? Hey. Um, <laughs> and yeah, if anyone wants to follow me, they can follow me on Twitter and Instagram uh, at Zoria Londonsk. So like Zoria Lahansk, but because I'm from London. Yeah, stupid name, but I thought I'd stick with it. And yeah, just we, on my page, we do just regular posts about everything to do with Ukrainian football, players ac- abroad, the national team, domestically, literally try and cover everything I can. Also do a weekly podcast called Ukraine Plus, the plus sign football, which uh, I do with two of my other friends. And yeah, we cover interviews with Ukrainian football royalty, such as Serhii Lebrov in English and other things such as the national team and all the other good stuff. And next week I'm going to Ukraine and I'll be doing a road trip with my podcast co-hosts around all of Ukraine, 6,200 kilometers worth, which is we're trying to do it in just over two weeks. And we're trying to visit all 63 professional sides it's going to be bloody mental because Ukrainian roads aren't the most reliable. Um, we're doing it in a car, but hopefully it's going to be historic and we'll be posting loads of content from that um, very short. So please do tune in if you want to see more about that. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks again, 
Andrew, it was an absolute pleasure uh, to have you on the podcast with us. Best of luck for this road trip. Stay safe. Enjoy yourself and listeners and viewers. Make sure to give Andrew a follow on his personal account as well as the Zoria Londonsk account as well. Otherwise, um, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please do give us a follow, give us a like, subscribe, all that good stuff. We've got a ton of content already out there and we're planning to bring plenty more your way over the course of this upcoming season and beyond so find us on your favorite podcast streaming platform just look for united mates football podcast same thing for our youtube channel if you prefer to watch these podcasts as videos across social media we're at united mates fp for twitter instagram and facebook and then check out our website www.unitedmatesfp.com for all of our podcasts social content and some very niche and amusing articles as well Until next time, everyone, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Goodbye.